As always is the case, times are changing. In our society, the place of the church and biblical Christianity is changing. For the church in America, some doors are closing as others open up. It's very important that uh, the church, that our church, refocus on its purpose, its mission, and its vision. We spent the last almost a month reviewing those things, and tonight, the congregational meeting, we'll see how that's going to make a difference in our church staffing. But that in turn raises the question of how the church's mission is financed. Because prosperity in America is changing too. Money is getting tighter for more and more people. So not only our spending, but also our giving has to be focused. And it has to be geared for maximum effect. Godly giving is going to be our topic for the next month or so. We're going to be focusing on two texts. One main one in the New Testament and then one in the Old Testament. The first text we're going to be looking at is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me just read this section to you. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This financial collection that Paul's talking about here became the most important practical project of his career. The driving force behind his third and his last missionary tour Finishing this project literally cost him his freedom and his life. The early days of the church were dominated by a complex of issues surrounding the Jewishness of the Christian church. At first, the Christian church was entirely Jewish. Jesus, the apostles, all the early converts, Jewish. But Jesus said that he had fulfilled the Jewish prophecies and the images and the offices and the sacrificial system and the dietary laws and all those things which had had meaning to explain him. He had fulfilled them all. Now the essence of redemption through his cross and his resurrection was God's gift to every nation. Every nation. And Peter led the way in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And then uh, the cause was taken up in earnest by the apostle Paul. Paul shared the gospel not only with his Gentile friends, he took it to a series of Roman providences, provinces, essentially other nations, whole nations, and he would come and bring the gospel to them. And within one generation, Christian Gentiles outnumbered Christian Jews. The balance was changing. Jewish Christians thought that they were inviting Gentiles into their faith. But now it began to feel as though the Jews were guests in a new Gentile faith. Paul realized that it was absolutely crucial, crucial for the church to see itself differently. Not as Jewish and Gentile, but Jewish, Roman, Greek, European, African, Asian, all Christian. A brotherhood whose members identified themselves in terms of faith not nationality, not politics, not race. And so Paul developed a great project. Nothing demonstrates the nature of what we believe than how more than how we spend our money. Jesus said, you're either bound to him or you're bound to money, and they are mutually exclusive. 
can't be both. It's one or the other. And so on his second missionary tour, as he brought the gospel to Europe, in each new church, he asked them to please establish a fund for the relief of Jewish Christians. Israel was undergoing a famine, general economic depression at the time. And Paul asked each Gentile church, just as soon as they were organized, would you please establish a fund to help their Jewish brothers? And Paul said, I will return. And when I return, I'll collect whatever you've gathered and I'll take it back. And that return was his third missionary tour. And Paul had tremendous hope that this fund, this grand collection, he hoped that if Gentile Christians would treat Jewish Christians as brothers, it would illustrate how Jew and Gentile could find a new and a common identity in Jesus and start to break down those walls of hostility and generate a trust and a love that Jesus Christ's church was going to have to have if it was going to become truly a new humanity around the world. Now during his last tour, Paul was clearly told by prophecy that if he returned to Jerusalem again, enemies of the gospel would have him arrested. But this gift and delivering it was so important to Paul that he went back anyway. And of course he was. He was imprisoned for years and eventually executed. But I think that given the chance, he would have done it all over again. So, this text that we're going to be studying in 2 Corinthians 8 is not about funding the regular church budget. It's not about sending missionaries. It was all about what Paul called in verse 7 there, the grace of giving. So the principles in this text should hold true for any kind of financial stewardship. There are just tons of principles in this one chapter. Even though we're going to spend several weeks on it, uh, we're not going to get them all. But today we're going to look at just the first one. I think it's the most basic and it's the most important principle of godly giving. We approach this principle by noting that any financial gift to Christ's church is, in essence, a gift to Jesus Christ. Now, of course, this collection was for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. It was a gift for them, but it was a gift to Jesus Remember that what Jesus said about his return, he said, uh, he gave a picture of it. He said when he comes back as king and humanity is gathered before him, they're going to be separated the way a flock of sheep and goats together would be separated out, sheep on one side, goats on the other. Remember that? And the sheep would represent in this parable those who are saved and the goats those who aren't. And King Jesus would reveal the tr their true faith of these people, not by a confession of whatever they said, but rather by their actions and their love toward others in his church. And Jesus sees every gift to one of his brothers, one of God's people, as a personal gift to him. That's how he treats it. That's how he feels about it. This intimate connection between the Lord and those who trust him run all over scripture. Let me give you a couple examples from the Old Testament. God, for example, considered gifts to the poor in Israel to be personal loans to him. Not loans from him, loans to him that he'd be good for. Isn't that amazing? Or, uh, on the other hand, there were times when gifts to the poor in Israel could be considered offerings to God himself. There was one tithe in particular, you know there were not several tithes, but there was one tithe in particular which was to be shared with the poor. A, a tithe is a gift to God, it's an offering to God, but that's still an offering to God even when it helps God's people. There's something very personal and very intimate about godly giving. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your gifts might be in secret. And then, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You don't feel that way about your mortgage or your grocery bill or how much you spend on gas. But, but giving for the covenant community, giving for his church, is uniquely personal. Why is that? Because when you give for God's people, God considers it a private and personal gift to him. He sees it. 
It's a gift to him. Christians don't like to talk about their religious giving. It's not because they're shy, and it's not because they're being modest. It's for the same reason we don't talk about intimate gifts between husbands and wives, or a mother and a daughter, or a father and a son. They're personal. They're more than the things that they are. Photos, lockets, rings worn for generations, grandpa's old watch, an old rifle. I still have one or two old tools from my dad. They're gifts that represent a precious relationship. Every gift for God's church is such a gift to him. Every offering we give comes with a whispered, this is for you, Lord. Your church matters to you, the people, the institution. Well, if it matters, if they matter to you, then they matter to me. This gift is for you. If we could touch Jesus, we would, we would put it in his hands, clasp our hands around his. This money is going to pay sister's uh, electric bill or a brother's salary or keep the lights on or send a missionary. But whatever it accomplishes, this is for you, Lord. Why is it so important for us to give to the Lord? That question brings us to the first principle of godly giving. And that is that all godly giving is a response to his gifts to us. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that you through his poverty, might become rich. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved courts for stable floor. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as poor. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake, became us man, stooping so low, but sinners raising heavenwards by thine eternal plan. Thou who art love beyond all telling, Savior and King, we worship thee. Emmanuel within us dwelling, make us what thou wouldst have us be. Thou who art love beyond all telling, Savior and King, we worship thee. When we address the question of how the church is financed, all other answers bow before this one. Jesus finances his own church. He paid for it by becoming human. He paid for it with his blood, with his death. He pays for it still. God the Son remains bound to a human body for all eternity. Forever living, forever living to make intercession for us, we're told. Jesus' death paid for our sins once and for all. His resurrection secured perfect life for us once and for all. But he lives as the God-man to mediate, to connect mankind and God forever. Jesus didn't tithe his love. He gives 100%. As the perfect man, he gave all of himself to God the Father. Therefore, he gave all of himself for the Father's church. When we begin to think about principles of godly giving, this is where we've got to begin. It's not with our giving. It's with Jesus' giving. It's more than that he's just a great example of generosity for us. The church exists because Jesus gave it all and still does. We say that everything we own today is a gift of God's grace. Of course that's true. That's true for every human being, whether they're Christian or non-Christian. But tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, or next month, or whenever, every one of us is going to leave this world. And we're going to leave behind everything that we thought we owned. And we're going to discover that everything we actually own for all eternity was we, we owe to Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to enrich himself 
at our expense. Jesus did not come to take anything from you. Well, except your sin and your worry and your bitterness and your fear, but he didn't come to take any of your money. In every gathering that is ever recorded about Jesus Christ, in every personal encounter, he never asked for a dime. Some people gave him money anyway. He put that in a common purse for the disciples' needs and to help the poor, and he gave it to Judas to take care of. Think of all the people Jesus healed. Think of the families who received back their dead son or their dead daughter or their dead brother. Think of people who were delivered from demonic oppression. Think of lepers who in so many ways got their lives back. Think of the first disciples who followed him because he alone had words of eternal life. He never asked them for money. Jesus did not come to take your money. Jesus came to give you your life back. To bring you before God's presence where the leprous sores on your soul become visible in his holy light and cleanse you so that you're fit for God's presence. Jesus came to drain away the fluid, the fear that makes it so hard to breathe in this light and turn the grave from a nightmare into a place where your body can rest while your soul builds expectation at God's side for a resurrection and renewal of all things. Jesus came to give you the most remarkable inheritance ever conceived. He came to bequest you with everything. Not a thousand years on 200 acres with $10 million, no. An eternity owning the whole earth, all of it. And in order to give you this, Jesus gave himself. He didn't put something in a plate. He didn't, didn't work just for three years. He gave his life. He exchanged his beautiful reputation for yours. And he was hung to death as a result. He took your place at your execution, setting you free. What did we pay for all that? Jesus didn't come to take your money or anything of value from you. And until you get that, my friend, you're just playing with Christianity. I believe that a true barometer of our faith is our giving. But not the way you might think. It's not by how much we give in an absolute sense. Paul said in verse 2 here, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, out of their extreme poverty, welled up in rich generosity. Paul used Philippi and Thessalonica as examples, but it, what, they weren't examples of a large offering in absolute terms. They were hurting as much as the Jews in Jerusalem. They gave only what they could scrape together, but they scraped deep. Because this was a chance to give something special to Jesus. Giving to the church and the mission for which Jesus gave his life is a privilege. It is not a command. It is not required for your salvation. It's a celebration, voluntary, of the relationship that is forged between God and us through what Jesus paid. You've probably seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Have you seen it? It's still pretty popular, isn't it? Ought to be seen. George Bailey gave up his own dreams to devote his life to the people of Bedford Falls. And then, through no fault of his own, he faced financial ruin. In that marvelous final scene, the people of the town rally to his aid, not because they are required to do so in any sense, but simply because they love him 
and they are grateful for all he has done for them. And he affirms at the end that he is the richest man in the world. He is rich in love, expressed in gifts that are freely and gratefully given. It's a great film. I love George Bailey, but I don't identify with George Bailey the most in this film. I know maybe we're supposed to, you know, realize that no man is a failure if he has some friends and so on, but I didn't identify with George the most. In the movie, he was generous by nature his whole life. He struggled with it occasionally, but he was always, always able to give. That's not the way Bedford Falls was. The movie shows us that without George, it would just be Pottersville, another hapless, hopeless town of lost and lonely people. I love George Bailey's beaming face. But that's not my favorite view. This is my favorite view. Look at the faces on these folks of Bedford Falls. In the, in the story, George naturally, he was rich in things that counted. But not these people. Without George, they would be the hopeless people of Potterville. Look at them now. Look at them. These folks became rich through George. Look at that pile of money. Most of it's dollar bills. They didn't have a lot of money, but they were rich. They were rich because they could afford to give. They could afford to be generous with whatever they had because they had been loved by this man. His love had made them rich in love, irrespective of how much money they had to work with. Rich enough to love back. Christian, we've been loved by this man. I've been loved by this man. He thought of me before the first day of creation. He came for me at Bethlehem. He took a cross for me. He is preparing now a kingdom to share with me right now. And I have the inestimable privilege of bearing his name and doing his work. I'm talking about the name Christian, not pastor. And he wants me to live forever with him. And he enjoys that his, he enjoys his spirit. And so he enjoys, since his spirit is in me, he likes being with me. He likes being with me right now. Poor me. I am very, very rich. Not like George Bailey but like the happy people of Bedford Falls, looking back and loving back the person who loved them with his whole life. Godly giving is always a response to Christ giving. That's the most important thing to remember. It's the first principle we learn in this text. Godly giving is always a response to Christ giving. In the final analysis, Jesus didn't come to build buildings or finance institutions or hire staff or fulfill visions. He said he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Although he was rich, for our sake he became poor so that in our poverty we might become rich. If I get that, I am going to build his church out of love as rich as his, however much money I've got to do it with. So what question shall I suggest we talk about? For the first question, as we think about giving, here's the first question I think we should talk about. How real to me is God's love? Giving is an expression of love. We love because he first loved us. So this is the place to start. Jesus cares more about what he can give me than what I can give him. This may be the most important question we ask in this study. To make it mean more, I urge you to discuss this question with somebody else. Open your mouth and talk about what you think. Talk about what you feel, and especially for this question, you know, Bill and I would be delighted to discuss it with you if you'd like. Take us up on it. And of course, 
feel free to share your thoughts on our website. Let's pray. Father, we're about to come to your table. It seems only fitting and proper that we come offering ourselves to you. You deserve all our very best. You deserve more than that. We want to devote ourselves to you wholly, and we, we do so now as best we can. Jesus, we want so much to give to you, to express in tangible ways our love for you. But even as we put our devotion into your hands, we see the wounds. Wounds that you bear to this day, wounds that you bear for us, that we might be welcome at your Father's throne. You are still giving to us. We walk up to your table only because your spirit holds us up. And as our faith partakes of these elements, you continue to nourish and strengthen us. Lord, again, we open our heart to your love. Love us. Love us well. And make us so rich that we can afford to love back to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Here is the essence of what Jesus gave. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. In remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul said, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim it. <laughs> 